Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, the Allen Foundation for, uh, uh, of course, funding us and for uh, organizing this meeting. It's a real treat to be here and, and hear about this fabulous science that is being presented today. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely great. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to deviate a little bit from the usual like systems biology, pure systems biology talk I usually you know, give. I usually talk only about understanding systems. Today I am going to be talking a little bit about uh, engineering, forward engineering systems. And, and Jim this morning gave a, a really fabulous introduction to synthetic biology or, or uh, you know, engineering biology. And he motivated that by uh, uh, the, the, the idea, which has, a, of course, a lot of merit, that by hacking cells, we can co-opt them to our benefit for therapeutics, for biofuels, for energy, and for various other things. And, you know, by hearing Jim talk, I just filled with hope that this is actually going to become reality uh, and we are well on our way. Uh, I am also today going to actually argue that engineering biology has another precisely and rationally and robustly and with reproducible effects has also merit in helping us understand what exists. So by interfacing, uh, by interfacing synthetic circuits with endogenous biological circuits in a way that allows us to perturb them, to shake them, to move them, to stretch them in precise ways might allow us to uh, go forward with understanding the endogenous biological systems faster in a more systematic way. Uh, and this is, uh, this is actually something that in evolution, in the way you know, I think about science, so it was my own intellectual evolution in the last uh, uh, three years, and uh, it came uh, in, in a big part out of the project that we did with the, with, with the Allen funding. Uh, engineering biology is a lot of fun, and I don't know if that uh, it is playing, if that video is playing, but you can actually make cells blink, and it's a lot of fun to make cells blink. And what you're looking at here is uh, actually a transcription factor called MSN2, which is fluorescently tagged, that goes in and out of the nucleus, and it goes in and out of the nucleus because we actually engineered that cell so that when we uh, shine a pulse of blue light on a light-responsive adenylate cyclase, it produces cyclic AMP, which activates PKA, which sends MSN2 in and out of the nucleus. And you see an increasing frequency, so you can you know, this is computer control, so you can play with that. And out of this, this was actually part of our original ideas for the Allen folding. Out of this, uh, we were able to understand the feedback loops in PKA signaling, uh, to understand their time scales, and also to map a broad swath of, uh, you know, cellular biology that is downstream of, of, of this process. This is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. That was kind of the beginning of our thinking that, uh, you know, sometimes simple circuits, simple synthetic constructs that are not pleistropic, that go to a molecule and push it and pull it in precise ways can give you a huge window into biological function. So biological devices to prose endogenous circuits. I'm going to talk to you today about another set of biological synthetic circuits that, uh, or, or devices that we since have uh, actually optimized. And these have been actually in the literature. We didn't build them. Uh, this was before synthetic biology was coined. It was called, engineering biology was called foreign gene expression, which is really remarkable. That was not so long ago. Uh, so so the, the building blocks I'm going to be talking to you about is, are uh, synthetic transcription factors, and what these are, are uh, uh, hormone receptors that when you give them their cognate hormone, they dissociate from various other things that keep them inactive, such as H HSP90, they translocate into the nucleus. And if you add to them uh, a GPS unit, a DNA binding domain, they can go into the nucleus and they find their target and bind to it. And now, so this is the GPS, this is the input signal processing. This is the GPS. Now, if you add actuation, in this case, an activation domain, then you find the gene. You find the gene, and uh, you 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 
you activate it. Okay? These are remarkably modular uh, 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 um, um, the biological devices. So you can mix and match different hormone receptors with diff different DNA binding domain to give it specificity and different activation domain to give it different dynamic range and dynamics. So, for example, you can use the estradiol, uh, the estrogen receptor activated by estradiol. You can give it a GAL4 DNA binding domain and an MSN2 binding domain. So now it finds uh, uh, GAL4 uh, uh, genes that have GAL4 binding sites. Uh, or you can use another uh, 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 receptors that is responsive to progesterone. Now you can put another. Uh, transcription DNA binding domain, in this case an artificial zinc finger, and you can target another set of gene and so on. So you can mix and match a number of these, and you can target different things with different inputs independently. So, and you can put them in the same cell. So you can push and pull on different genes. And my talk today is basically to say, uh, so what do you do with that, right? It turns out there's a lot of things you can do with that. Let me give you an example, just a simple example for today. So basically, you have two dials. You can crank up and down and dial two different gene expression levels for two different genes. If you find yourself in the familiar position where you have a pathway, it actually doesn't matter. This is the cell wall integrity pathway, but it doesn't matter what it is. And you know that this pathway interacts with another pathway. And you're tasked with the quest of finding where, OK? So crosstalk between two different pathways. And suppose you know that it's mediated by some molecule R. And this R is, in this particular case, a repressor. Can you, in a systematic and almost algorithmic way, figure out where these two pathways crosstalk, where the wires are tangled? So let me cut a long story short and tell you that you actually can. And it's actually quite remarkably intuitive. So let me simpl simplify that problem. Suppose I have this pathway. It has W, X, Y, and then you can read out Z at the output. R represses somewhere in this pathway. And I want to differentiate between the situation was R, X, for example, upstream of, of X, or X downstream of X. Now, if I, hook, oh, if I hook one of these volume knobs to X and one to R, and I dial up and down X and R simultaneously and measure Z at the output, can I actually tell which one can I discriminate between these two different scenarios? So yes, you can. This is why I'm telling you the story. So actually, if you compile the dose response, and this is, in this case, it's the two-dimensional dose response of Z, which is the output as a function of X, and the color coding is for R, what you see is that for the, this, what I'm calling an upstream topology, if the repressor is upstream of, the, of, of, of X, then as you would expect, as you dial in more X, Z increases, because this is a positive effect. Now, if you dial in more R, uh, Obviously, the, those responses push down, but you see this very characteristic fan in okay, of the dose responses. You compare that to the alternate scenario, and you see that they're qualitatively different. It's not a subtle quantitative thing. They're qualitatively different. And of course, in most cases, this is an analysis of a computational model. Intuition becomes really obvious after the math is done. It's not before the math is done, it's after the math is done that you actually understand what's going on. So, so in this case, uh, you see this collapse of the dose responses as, as you crank up the X. Uh, it's because at enough X, you just don't need the X that is produced by W. So you can put as much R as you, need, as you want. That pathway is short-circuiting the negative effect of R. Well, in this case, R is in the way, right? So you just put in X, R interrupts it. You put in X, R interrupts it, and that causes this shift up and down. And it's usually, it's actually not a pure shift up and down. This is, in most cases, a fan out. So it fans out at higher concentrations of X. 
Now, what happens if they're acting at the same node? Well, it looks qualitatively similar to the upstream configuration. It has diff different quantitative attributes, and we actually, I'm not gonna go into the weeds here, but we actually can tell from different attributes rather than the, just the qualitative change. So let's play a game. I'm gonna show you data and you tell me where things are with respect to each other. Here's the game. Going back to the motivating example, this is a cell wall damage pathway. This is a molecule called MSG5. I hook it up to one dial. I hook, and I'm simplifying things here, of course, but I'm, I'm hooking uh, the other one, the other dial to this. This is the data. Do you think MSG5 is upstream of this or downstream? And here's your cheat sheet. Is it up, down, middle? What do you think? Down. 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 It is down, right? Let's play another game. Here's PTP3. Where do you think it is? Is it down? Absolutely it is middle. Okay? So, so these, these answers we knew. These are examples we picked because we knew the answer and we wanted to vet that we're not just, you know, kind of oversimplifying the problem. Let's play this one last time. MSN2. Is it up or down? Down. It is absolutely down. And that we did not know. As a matter of fact, so MSN2 is that molecule I was pulsing that was blinking in the, in the few slides back. It's the same one. As a matter of fact, we had no idea that the ESR, which is the MSN2 mediated response in Servicia, actually interacted with the, with, the, with, the, with the cell wall integrity pathway. And what happened is that the first synthetic biology tool, the blinking tool, led us to this interaction, and then we were faced with the question, how do we go about figuring out where the wires cross? We hook them up to these, you know, to these other synthetic biology tool, and in no time, like you see the data and there's no doubt it's down, and it's actually, you now go and do a single Western blot because this is a phosphorylation cascade. When you overexpress MSN2 from this, SLC2 loses its phosphorylation. So you're killing the signal here, and it's, what I described to you is an algorithmic, systematic way to finding these wires and where they cross. So, and of course, you know, we, 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 we're doing that for a whole lot of things. We, you know, I, I, I simplify the problem for you because we actually have to do kind of a matrix of these interaction in order to really kind of div divide and conquer and see where the more likely places are, where, where these wires cross and so on. But it's actually a manageable thing. You know, engineering these things into cells is actually almost trivial with our current technologies. So, so one can imagine doing that and actually high throughput. So that brings me to uh, almost my last slide, which is untangling the wires. And I think this is actually still a largely unfulfilled promise. Figuring out true functional cellular connectivity. So I would argue that we actually need multiple dials in any one cell, so that one gene, one deletion approach is only gonna take us so far. So we need to think about uh, what is it that we need to dial? How, I, I gave you an example where we dial on too many things. There's nothing magical about two. Can we do three? What would three give us in addition to two? Four, five, where should we stop, right? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, what happens if these pathways have actually feedback that I showed you, have feedback loops operating on the same time scale? Would that still work? I have no idea. So this is a call, I think, for theorists and computational biologists to partner with people who are doing these kind of experiments at a genomic scale to build not only statistical way of thinking about these problems, but rigorous interpretation and analysis frameworks, hopefully of the type that I described to you today. 
And here's a challenge, kind of a thought experiment for you know, the group of luminaries in this room. I was so happy when we found this MSN2 cell wall integrity pathway connection because that's you know, going to get us papers and more grants and more money and so on. So that's great. But I was also pissed at the same time. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We should not be finding new interactions. When are we going to stop finding new interactions? And if we say, okay, I don't want to, I want to, I want to live to a time, I want to end my career at a time when there's no more interactions to be found in Saccharomyces cerevisiae or any model organisms, let's say 10, 20 years, what is it that we need to do? Right? What is it that we need to do so that we can find all of the wi these wires, where they cross, and then I can hand it over to Marcus so that he, put it, he puts, can put it in his modeling pipeline and we actually have a fully predictive model of a cell, any cell, right? I think it's worth thinking about that. It's not, it's not science fiction or insanity. I think, I think with the technologies we have currently for biological engineering, we should be thinking about these type of questions. So with that, a brain teaser, I'm not going to give you the answer to that. If I take my two dials and put them in a series, what do you think I'm going to get? Think about it. Here's a hint. If you want to get better quality sound by hooking your phone to a speaker, do you crank up the volume on your speaker or on your phone? What is the better strategy? If you think about that, you're going to get the answer to what this circuit does. And it does something really interesting. OK? So, uh, of course, the work in, in this talk was not done personally by me on a day-to-day -day basis. It was done by a fabulous set of people uh, that are either now in the lab or have passed through Ignacio, Patrick, Kiran, Andres, and, and Raj, who did the, all the computational work. And many, many, many thanks for the Paul Allen Foundation for giving us the benefit of the doubt. Thank you very much. Questions? The microphone's coming your way. <clears throat> the point I'm a little stuck on is that you could find interactions that may not actually be relevant to a cell, right? So you could say, what do water and a subway system have in common? Nothing. But if you flooded the city of New York, then the subway is yeah. not going to work. Yeah. So how, how can you then validate the interactions that you find? So, so the operative kind of word that I use these, uh, here is functional interactions. There's increasing evidence, at least for transcription factors, that they actually stick everywhere. And if you do like chip seek and collect 5,000 interactions, odds are a small minute number of them is functionally important. So this is an absolutely legitimate question. In the example that I showed you, uh, it is actually the case that cells that are, uh, that, that, that are challenged with cell wall uh, integrity kind of challenges such as caspophagin or, or, or you know, things that break the cell wall, when you overexpress MSN2, uh, they're fair poorer, right? Which is completely counterintuitive. Right? Because the, uh, the MSN2 system is supposed to be this general stress response that helps cell no matter what. In this particular case, they don't. Right? So, 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 I, so I think we have to kind of couple that with, you know, these kind of strategies start from genomic studies and physiological studies, determine the things that matter and then the interactions that matter and then go back and mechanistically with you know, similar methods actually map these interactions. We, of course, are not going to be able to predict under any circumstance what a cell, or maybe we will, I don't know, but, but let, let's, you know, in the, in the 20 year time span, I think we have to start by defining the, the physiology we care about and then determine the wiring that implements that and then take it from there once we achieve that. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but yeah. Yeah, very okay. cool talk. Uh, one question um, that we think a lot about with the CRISPR-I and A things is, 
genes that um, don't have a dynamic range where the phenotype uh, you know, increases or decreases with gene dosage, but that w might have a much more switch-like behavior where uh, until you get near complete knockout, for example, or knockdown, uh, there's no phenotypic variation at all. Um, have you modeled them computationally as well? And would th th those be cases that you could still detect with your yeah, approach no, as well? Yeah, no, we have not. This is actually kind of brand new. This is you know, one example, and I believe we are at the tip of the iceberg. I don't know what would happen if the two interactions were positive. We haven't modeled that yet. So this is something we're starting you know, at, you know, as we speak. And definitely these kind of interactions that are more threshold-like or effects that only appear that are, you know, uh, nothing happens and then suddenly catastrophe are very, very important to kind of think about. And that's, that's going to be next, I hope.